Andy Mason with the University of Illinois Extension as the State Master Garden Coordinator, and I am so glad you've decided to join us. Well, if you're like me, you're getting a little bit of cabin fever. By the time February runs around, we, we really want to get out there and do something. Maybe you're trying to figure out what's on your to-do list. We're here to help you out, and we always have an ever-changing cast of characters. I think <laughs> they're always characters. Anyway, uh, and to help you out, and tonight is no different. And here, Bob, what do you have for us? My, my name is Bob Skirvin, and I, I taught horticulture university for 40, 40 years and retired now. But uh, my specialty is fruit crops, and so you're welcome to ask about that. But anyway, what I want to tell you is every time I, I'm on here, I tell you the same thing, that I love grocery stores. And the grocery store is right, there's <laughs> loaded with all sorts of fruits and vegetables right now, and it's really remarkable to go in and take, look, look around. There, and there's some really good things. Those little clementine oranges, they're on sale. They're really delicious and they're very not very expensive. And the blueberries, I talked about, they're really good. And the strawberry season is just beginning now, so they're pretty good. There's, lot, there's just a lot of really good things to eat. Now, one of the things, when you're eating, you also have to be thinking about your, about your di diet and health and so forth. And one of the things you want to do with every meal is make your plate a palate, make it a, eat a rainbow of color, as Sandy says. <laughs> Over there, and as you go through, you try to get things that are different colors because the pigments of a, of a red radish are, are different. And they have some health benefits that are different than a green cucumber or, or green cabbage, and so there's different things available. And one of the things, carrots come with different colors, and, uh, and right here, this thing right here is somebody bought the store. Is they've taken some carrots of different colors. Remember, I showed you there's the red ones and there's the yellow ones and they're kind of black like ones as well as the orange ones, and they've made them into a little. They've sh shaved them into things they call matchsticks here. And we buy these at home and put them in our salad. It's, it's, it's really, really nice, but then you get a lot of different pigments here. And Sandy was talking about, one of the things that's interesting about this, remember I, I brought in red carrots before, and you, you've seen them, or if you haven't seen them, go to the store and get them. They're really good, they're very sweet. But you try cooking with them, the pigments are water soluble, and the pigments come out, and it'll just ruin <laughs> the color of your food. You'll be just really thoroughly disgusted. <laughs> it's it's it really good for gray. you, and you're not gonna die, but it's certainly, <laughs> oh, you yeah. kind of wonder about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. So good for fresh eating, certainly. And yeah. I think, especially in the wintertime, sometimes it's hard to eat right because we're eating a lot of like carbs and stuff because yeah. we're trying to make yeah. it through the wintertime. So it's always a good reminder yeah, so to make sure pretty, you pretty do cool. that. I saw that today for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. And they're really, carrots are really pretty easy yeah. to grow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have halfway decent soil and stuff, so I think it's a good one to go through yeah, the catalogs. You, you can buy the different colors too. They have the sure. seeds, you can grow them in your garden. Sure, you absolutely. Great, good. I'd love to think about it. Fresh vegetables. So, Jim. Okay, I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired horticulturist, plant pathologist with the University of Illinois Extension. And I brought in a sample of a tree that was pot bound twice. The first set is buried inside the trunk, and uh, the second set is the outer one. And what I'm trying to indicate that when you are buying potted plants, you need to cut or spread the roots before you replant it, whether it's into another pot or into the ground. Because if you do not, the roots will circle and get embedded into the trunk and choke the plant. And sometimes, before the plant is actually choked to death, it will stress the plant out enough to give it cankers, which you can see in this part of the trunk. Uh, basically, uh, if this did not have the inner circling roots, this tree would have gotten a bigger, a fatter trunk, and the outer roots out here would have done the choking. Maybe it would have gotten 10, 15 years out of the tree, but this one didn't make it past two years. So make sure you spread or cut the roots when you are planting. Yeah, very good. And you know, it is one of those things that even when you when you buy plants, just to make sure that, you know, maybe kind of look and see if it looks like it's been in the pot for a really long time, right. maybe that's not going to be a really good bargain for you. And maybe it's better to get, you know, something a little different, make right. sure that they're yes. not pop bound. Sometimes plants. you got to get your fingers, it's not too bad. You can spread, spread right. your fingers, but sometimes it's so tough, you just have to get a knife in there and just take, right. take yeah. right. cut, cut yeah. the roots. I know a lot of people are afraid to spread the roots because, oh, I broke <laughs> yeah. them. Yeah. That's fine. Broken roots are better than circling roots. Right, so, absolutely. Yeah, cutting them or spreading Good. them, whether they break or not, is better than leaving them circled. Great, this will be our planting season here very soon. So, and Phil. I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an entomologist with the University of Illinois, extension entomologist, which means I do bugs, <laughs> insects, and uh, Sandy, not Sandy Mason, but another <laughs> Sandy, uh, wrote in and said that she found cyclamen mites on her Episcia Cleopatra, 
It also has African violets, streptococcus, and cheritas in the same area. Didn't want to spray, so threw everything out, which was the first best step. Uh, and has been using a 10% Clorox solution on the area. All the pots and trays. She's paranoid that they're still out there somewhere. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and I've, if I missed any, how long could they live without being on a plant? Take cuttings of some of my annuals and switch them in a 10% Clorox solution for five minutes in August, grow them under lights. Do you think I brought them in with the annuals? Could have brought them in with the annuals, could have brought them in with the African violets, could have brought them in with the streptococcus, could have brought them in on your clothes, could have blown in through the window. Uh, it doesn't really mean a whole lot of difference, but damage from cyclamen mite will cause the leaves, as you can see in the pictures, to kind of curl upward at the edges. There's another mite mm -hmm. that's very, somewhat closely related called a broad mite, which causes them to go downwards. So upward means cyclamen mite. And uh, mm -hmm. generally, they're a real problem on African violets and related plants such as gloxinias and streptocarpus and so on. And uh, generally what is done by hobbyists that have these plants, if they see this, they take them and pitch them. Oh. If you really want to plant, you grab, cut off a leaf or two, they root very well from leaves, leaf, leaves and uh, you would want to soak that in a 10% Clorox might work, but I would recommend a uh, insecticidal soap solution, which will do a better job and just maybe three or four minutes in there will kill any mites there and then you start growing them and, and kind of keep them separate from each other. The mites get around primarily indoors by crawling around because there's not a lot of air currents to blow them. They're exceedingly tiny, but they'll cause those inner leaves to be very hard to a touch as well. And uh, you can try uh, a miticide called AVID, A-V-I-D, on the leaf, plants if you want. They're, it's systemic through the leaf, but unfortunately your, uh, your cyclamen mites are right down in the bud area and it's probably not going to get there anyway. And so generally the best way is that uh, uh, go back to the Super Bowl and drop kick those particular <laughs> ones that are in bad shape <laughs> like and, and get ones oh, yeah. that, are, that are really better off for you because <laughs> In reality, that's generally what's done is you get rid of those that, that are infested and if you, mm -hmm. you just really need to keep that variety, uh, take a leaf, soak it in insecticidal soap, start out new plants off of it. Great, great. I'm going to make the comment that insecticidal soap would probably be a lot safer than the bleach. Yeah, it would be a lot safer than the bleach. It would be a lot safer than something you have sitting next to your sink uh, because essentially all soaps will kill tiny insects and mites. However, Many soaps are very effective, exceedingly effective at killing plants because it dissolves a waxy covering on the cuticle. And insecticidal soap has been selected not for ones that kill plant bugs, but for those that don't kill plants. And so yeah. spending the extra money getting the insecticidal soap, which is actually meant for it, is a much, much, much better way. Oh, and you can go on the internet and have, have testimonies by all kinds of people say, oh, don't buy that, I use this, or I use that, and I use that. Uh, pretty soon those people disappear because they've killed their plants. Oh, okay. <laughs> You mean everything on the web isn't right? Oh my oh, gosh, I'm my. stunned, I'm stunned. Anyway, anyway, so always a good reminder, insecticidal soap, it's always a good thing to have around. And I just brought in a little breath of spring air. What do you think? This is beautiful. This is actually uh, uh, hyacinths as well as daffodils. And this was actually a, a bowl of bulbs that was started by one of our great Master Gardener coordinators in Vermilion County. Um, it's uh, Jenny Hanrahan, and she gave this to me as a gift, which I thought was very, very nice of her. She started these about uh, the first week or so of November and then the last and stay, uh, they stayed in her uh, unheated garage. She went through the cold period and then a few weeks ago she brought them out and here they are and here you can see the flower buds coming on and so it's great. So what a great thing. So keep that in mind as you have bulbs toward the end of the season and what a great gift they would be for just about anyone I would say. Anyway, I love thinking about it. And I do want to also think about our podcasts that are coming up. Maybe you are one of those folks that's dying to see Diane Nolan again and hear from her and see what's going on with her. Well, the good news is the first podcast, uh, first episode of our Mid-American Gardener podcast with guest Diane Nolan is available on the web right now at midamericangardener.org. It's also available via iTunes as well as Stitcher. The next episode will be available in a couple of weeks 
as a reminder, if you do have any questions for us, either here on the show or the podcast, be sure to send them in via email at yourgarden at gmail.com or message us through Facebook. Just search for Mid-American Gardener. So it's always going to be good to hear from Diane again, and I'm sure several of us are also going to be on those podcasts, so check them out. Maybe don't go right now. Go a little bit later. <laughs> that, would, that would be good. Anyway, so we're going to go right to the phones on line two. We have Steve from Bloomington. Uh, you have a question about trees. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Sure. I really enjoy your show. Great. Um, I lost a huge ash tree last year, and I wanted to replace it with another tree. Um, I was wondering what the panel's favorite tree is and why. Favorite <laughs> trees. That's a good question. A lot of people are like losing trees from, from ash war, so Mine good replacements. Mine uh, male ginkgo tree. Male ginkgos? Very First nice. First of all, it doesn't have Me the too. smelly, stinky fruit of the female. And the ginkgo, compared to any other tree out there, has basically no major insects or diseases. It has, you know, it was a tree growing uh, around in dinosaur days, and it has survived because it's pretty much resistant to everything out there. So if it dies, it generally is human killing. Yeah, right. Gurning you guys got roots. favorite trees? Yeah. Favorite Gurning trees? Roots. Gurning roots. Yeah, yeah. or party right. point. No, shade trees? Now, if you, if you want to buy one of these things, you want to make sure you get a male ginkgo. They go, go to yeah. a regular company, and yeah. they take a graft, a, a seedling, but they take a graft a piece of male right. on there. And if you it, you can't tell yeah. for 20, 30 years whether it's a right. boy, or, yeah. boy or a girl. Yeah. Yeah. And if you screw up, you're gonna somebody well, you're gonna wish you hadn't done that. Yeah, because <laughs> a male and female can pollinate each other from a mile apart. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Well, one of the, I, I mean, white oak. We got to say white oak, right? Because yeah. white oak's a state tree of Illinois. Plus, I just say they're beautiful trees. They grow, actually, oaks grow much faster than people think they do, especially when they're young. They kind of slow down as they age, but a white oak is just a beautiful tree. Granted, it's got acorns, so you kind of have to think about, you know, you wouldn't want to put it over the sidewalk <laughs> or your car, where your car's going to be, maybe. But uh, they're beautiful trees. And really, in the long run, I just think any of the, I love all the oaks. So yeah. do you have any other... My favorite tree is a tree that your neighbors do not have. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good answer. And when you're looking for a replacement for an ash or any tree that has died, uh, the Morton Arboretum has lists that go hundreds of trees, uh, ones for Northern Illinois, Central Illinois, Southern Illinois, mm -hmm. and they correspond to other areas in the throughout the Midwest. And you look for something ideally that your neighbors do not have because that makes it less likely that an insect or disease is going to spread and, and take out that tree. Okay. So uh, there are just huge numbers of options, but you definitely, definitely do not want to plant what your neighbors have because <laughs> you're just increasing monoculture, asking for trouble. And it's the problem is, is that in our communities, anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of all of our trees have been ash because they're cheap. They grow fast and they look good. But now we know that they're not as cheap as they were because now you got to cut it down and they're all dying and it's not a real good tree because A, we planted too many of them. Yeah. Right, right. Add, good point. But let me add on to his neighbor thing. That is one mile in every direction from your house. Because if you're in an urban area, I mean, if you're out in the country, that may be fine. But when you're in the city, you know, you have to bear in mind, it's not your immediate neighbor, it's who's down the street and several blocks away because your diseases and insects do fly and blow. So if you want to minimize problems, look at how many trees of that kind are in a mile in every direction of your house and keep that population under 10% of whatever you choose. Yeah. Good, good, and thank you very much, Steve, for that question, because I think it, you do your homework. That's probably the biggest thing. Before you go to the garden center or whatever, do a little homework and figure out what's gonna be best for your area. So choose the tree for the right site. So thanks for that question, Steve. And on line three, we have Sarah from Villa Grove, and you have a question, oh, sounds like there's a problem with your apple tree. I planted two different varieties of apple trees in my backyard, and I went out recently and the bunnies have uh -oh. eaten the bark off almost all the way around. I I have put wire around now so they can't, but are the trees going to live or die? Yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have well, to wait depends. until spring. Yeah. It's amazing how much sometimes yeah. if there's a little cambium left, which is the active living part underneath the bark, if it's still there, it will survive. If a rabbit didn't chew all the way down to that, 
even though the bark is gone, sometimes they survive. But a good rule of thumb is if a bark is gone, the tree is, is, yeah. is a goner. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, the cambium is green, so if you see green, you got the cambium. If it's creamy white, they've gone past the cambium. But there is one other option. You can graft. <laughs> they call it bridge grafting. You take branches and you cut, um, graft below the chewing area to above the chewing area. And so the, and I actually had my grandfather did that to a fruit tree. And it looks weird when it gets old because it looks like your tree is growing on stilts. But it does work. You can wow. put four or five grafted branches over the chewed area and keep your tree alive. Wow. Yeah, that's, you can do that too if, you're, if, if it has little suckers. A lot of times the apple tree, especially young, the suckers, mm -hmm. the shoots coming up, is you can take one of those suckers and, and bend it over to the, the damaged part, above the damaged part, and kind of where it's smooth, take a little tack of bread, you call it, in there, and tack them together, put a little wax. And Might be worth a it. try. Yeah, it's worth mm -hmm. a try. It's probably, the rabbits are, rabbits yeah. like trees, maybe trees. Yeah. Deer. But, the, uh, but what's been done was a good preventative, and that is that. Uh, that uh, uh, hardware cloth wire netting, uh, poultry netting, uh, around the trunk of a tree to where it extends at least two feet above your predicted deepest snowfall, because uh, Peter can stand on top of a, of a crusted snow and stretch up at least a foot and a half up at that trunk and uh, have, have it sticking out from the trunk. Don't have it against the trunk because they'll bite right through that and get to the bark. But that's a, that's a good protection against, uh, against rabbit damage. And then while you're doing it, you wanna make sure that uh, you, you move a mulch away from the base of a tree in the fall and, uh, and move away snow when it falls to keep the voles or the meadow mice from girdling your tree right down to root yeah, line. So it's tough, it's tough <coughs> when there's a lot of snow. Well, so, I, yeah, I remember so. at our university farm, and one, one of the years we had a really good snow that the voles would kind of walk along the snow and just actually they, <laughs> yeah. would, they would fall down in, in, in inside that little cage yeah. with uh, the wire in there. And they had it made good. and they just oh. polished off those trees because oh. they were protective of the birds because they were in that little cage there and they really ate away. So, yeah, well, you they know, need get, to get, eat get the wire too. up high. In 1979, okay. okay, we had the six foot snows in the Chicago area. And between those two years, there was hardly any fruit trees left because the voles ate from uh, underneath and the rabbits ate from the top down and they met in the middle as the snow yes. melted. <laughs> wow, those dastardly voles. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay, so on line four, we have Pat from Moequa, and you're trying to get an orchid to bloom. That's right, I bought an orchid last Valentine's Day, <clears throat> and I've tried to get, I've kept it alive, but I can't get it to bloom, and I've got it in a south window, and it's warm, and, uh, what are you doing wrong? So I assume it's probably one of the moth orchids. It had kind of a big flower, almost looked like a moth. Because there's different types of orchids, but those are the real common ones, are the moth orchids. Yeah, uh -huh. that's, that sounds probably... I don't know what kind it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I have an orchid, and I'm reflowering it. And it takes time. But one of the things I do, I'm trying to minim uh, mimic the environment. And orchids suck most of their nutrients through their leaves. And their roots are basically just anchor them to the tree that they grow on. So I, you know, when I water, and I add a little tiny bit of fertilizer to that water, uh, maybe like a fourth of a teaspoon to a quart, and I pour that water over the leaves and then a little bit into the bark mulch. And I have them in a south window. I have one plant in front of it to break the full sun on it because these plants are growing on trunks of trees in the jungle, so they're shaded. They're not getting direct sun. So bear that in mind. Maybe, you know, be careful how much direct sun they get, but they really do like lots of bright light, but they also like to be moist, so water them via their leaves. Yeah, so don't, and don't water them too much. Right. That's, sometimes people love them to death. And I think, especially for some of the younger ones, I think they actually need a difference of temperature between the night and the day. So they actually need that cooler night, warmer day. So it may be one of those things you're going to have to. But I would, I, what I would do is this uh, summer, go ahead and put it outside underneath mm -hmm. a shade tree. Often that helps them to sort of get into that, that mode. So, so hopefully that at least gives you some ideas. So. And on line six, we have Shirley from Bloomington. And you have some bulbs. What can we do for you, Shirley? Calling about, I called once be before about paper white bulbs that I grow, uh -huh. and they all get about 20, 22 inches tall. 
and I can't get them to stay short. Well, one of your gardeners on on the, one of the shows <laughs> a <vodka>. while back <laughs> mm-hmm. to keep them short. If you use one quarter teaspoon of vodka to seven parts water, right? And so I tried it. I tried another batch of them. And by golly, it worked. And it worked? Oh, yeah. great. <laughs> that was Jennifer <laughs> Nelson talked about that. It, it was nice. That you don't have to eat. 10, 11 inches tall, but it's That's one part vodka and seven parts water, and it worked. <laughs> That's yeah. great. So it you can drink with your daffodils. That's right. what I say. It was nice, and you don't drink have to use a high price vodka either. You can use the cheap stuff. <laughs> That's so great to hear. So thank you so much for letting us know about that, that how well that worked. That's wonderful. And yeah. uh, thank you so much. I should try that on my Hisense, huh? Anyway, so thanks. <clears throat> and online too, we have Barbara from Springfield, and you have, uh-oh, sounds like you got some spider mites on your Alberta spruce. I sure do. I have about nine uh, Alberta spruces in my yard, uh, varying from three to six feet tall. They look like they're sunburned on one side oh, of, wow. of each tree. And I can, um, I sprayed them weekly for um, in the fall through to uh, stopped in the winter and should I replace these plants um, should I take them down and not replace them this season because the spider mites might be lingering what do I do yeah. uh, that doesn't have to be beside us next to the street does it that's sunburn looking side on almost all of them they're about six of them in a berm. There are a bunch of them along the front of the house and they all seem to have, uh, they're all kind of on the south side of the um, uh, of each tree. But is that on the street side? Yes and no. We're, okay. we're, we've got two acres. So in my experience, I have never seen spider mites attack one side of a tree. Uh, I was guessing that it might be that you're getting solid injury from the street more than anything else. Uh, what you need to do is go out in the spring uh, and check for spider mites. You essentially put a white piece of paper underneath a branch, smack it pretty hard a couple, three times, and you should be seeing little tiny uh, greenish gray dots moving around on the, on the paper. And if you rub your hand across it, you'll get green streaks. That's an indication you have spider mites. And then you can use, uh, use a miticide anywhere from insecticidal soap uh, to other miticides that are sold in garden centers and you would do it uh, you would spray one time and then a week later and this is typically going to show up in the Springfield area you'll start seeing the uh, seeing the spider mites showing up probably around the middle part of uh, uh, middle part of April into uh, or even early April in through about uh, through, through a month of April and that's when you need to be checking if you do not find the mites or if you see little reddish ones that are moving faster, take your spray and put it in the shed. Uh, <laughs> because what you have is you have predatory mites that if you spray that tree, you will kill those off and set yourself back to ground zero. But I have never, ever seen spider mites attack a, attack a needled evergreen on just one side. They usually go at least, uh, at least most of the way around and you may have just a few, few b- other branches. So I'm concerned that it may be, it could be, could be due to something else. It might even be girdling roots on the on the base. Especially you if it's all. You need to verify what you have before you just spray. And certainly spraying all summer long is is uh, all but two or three of those sprays are totally useless. Uh, the spider mites that, that attack spruces occur in the spring, and then they occur in the fall, say in mid September through October. Through the middle of summer, there aren't any on there except eggs. You're just uh, you're just exercising yourself spraying them. Okay, always, always, always good to know, and, and I think timing especially is important mm-hmm. on because they come a little bit earlier than other spider mites. Timing and surveying, so scouting. I think, I think we have time for one of our uh, Bob. Do you have an email for us, or? Yeah, I can do one. Yeah. We got a a question from somebody named Thank You. Thank you. <laughs> You're thank you. We like thank you. Yeah. Anyway, uh, they said uh, I love strawberries and raspberries, and please tell me the best time to plant these fruits. How to keep the critters out of eating them. And they, they also, they recently acquired hip layer trough, trough uh, well, planter anyway. Would this be a super receptacle? Now, strawberries and raspberries, yeah, the, the best time, right, right now, if you haven't ordered plants, then you really got to get your rear in gear and, and do that. And order as fast as possible. Usually, in order to get the very best plants, 
you have to order them in the fall. But anyway, but there are some companies that, that have really, really good quality strawberries and raspberries. Get them in, and then you can take a plant. The nice thing about strawberries and raspberries, you can plant them as early as you can get out there in the field. So we, at, at the university, we used to plant them like middle of March. So the ground has to be thawed out. It really, is, as soon as the soil starts to warm up, the roots will grow. The top doesn't grow very much, okay. but the root will. The strawberries, if the strawberries do bloom, the frost will kill them. But that's, it doesn't hurt the plant. It just gets the stru it gets okay. the strawberries all that gets better okay. established. And so get in there and plant them early. Same thing with raspberries. It gets raspberries middle of March, April, is perfect. And they really, they really will grow. It's time okay, to do very it. good. Thanks, thanks. Very good. And yeah, always a good time to be thinking about fruit crops. And uh, it always goes so fast. And get out there and start checking out the catalogs. Uh, don't forget our podcasts. Uh, the first one actually is available today. So right after the show, go check out the podcast and certainly send in your questions. We'd love to hear what you have on your mind and how we can help you. So have a great week gardening.